Hi everyone, Tom here from Frontend Beginners, and in this video, we'll look at how the Flex Basis property works in CSS Flexbox. For this example, I've set up a flex container that's 1000 pixels wide and given it a gray background. Inside it, I've created three flex items, each 200 pixels wide and of different colors. The Flex Basis property determines the initial starting size of a child flex item before either flex grow or flex shrink is applied to it. As flex basis works together with flex grow and flex shrink, to fully understand how flex basis works, we first need to have a basic understanding of the flex grow and flex shrink properties. In our example, we have a 1000 pixel wide parent flex container. It contains three child flex items, each with a width of 200 pixels. The combined width of the flex items is therefore 600 pixels, leaving us with 400 pixels of positive free space inside our container. By default, flex items have a flex grow value of zero which means they are not allowed to grow to fill any positive free space that may be left over inside their parent container. If each child item is given a flex grow value of one, this means they will share the available positive free space equally among themselves and each will grow by the same amount to fill the container. Let's have a look at this by giving all of our child flex items so these are our three flex items with a class of square. So we'll give all of them a flex grow value of one. As you can see, our three child items have grown to fill the parent container. Flex shrink works in the opposite way. If the combined width of the child items is larger than the width of their parent container, Flex shrink allows the child items to shrink down in size so that they do not overflow the boundaries of their container. By default, flex shrink is set to a value of one, which means items shrink by an equal amount if their combined width is larger than the container width. Let's have a look at an example of this by increasing the width of our flex items from 200 pixels up to 400 pixels. Their combined width is now 1200 pixels, which is wider than our 1000 pixel container. The child flex items should be overflowing the edge of the container, but the default flex shrink value of one doesn't allow this to happen and our items remain contained within it. If we give our items a flex shrink value of zero, we'll see that they now overflow the container as they are no longer allowed to shrink. So what does all of this have to do with flex basis? Let's delete the flex shrink property and reset the width to 200 pixels. By default, all child flex items are given a flex basis value of auto. What this means is if a flex item has a specified width, like our items here have a width of 200 pixels, their initial starting width will be the same as this specified width. Each of our flex items starts at 200 pixels wide. If our items didn't have a specified width, let's remove this width of 200 pixels by commenting it out, a flex basis of auto would size them according to their content's minimum width or min content width. In this case, our flex items are no longer 200 pixels wide, but are now as wide as the content they contain. If we change the text inside our first item from the word one to the number one, we'll be able to see this even more clearly. Our three flex items are different widths based upon the width of the content they contain. 
Aside from the default value of auto, which initially sizes our flex items according to either the width of their content or their absolute width specified in the CSS, we can also provide flex basis with a specific width value, either in pixels, relative units, or as a percentage. To demonstrate this, let's give each of our flex items a flex basis of 200 pixels. As you can see in the browser, each one of our flex items is now 200 pixels wide. Their flex basis, or starting size before flex grow or flex shrink is applied, is 200 pixels. If we change this flex basis value to 300 pixels, their starting width will change accordingly. They are now 300 pixels wide. If we now change this to 10%, their starting width will be 10% of the parent container width. Aside from specifying a specific flex basis value, we can also use the keyword content, which sizes the items according to their min content width. However, this keyword is not widely supported, and so it's generally considered best practice to use a flex basis of auto and not to specify a width for your items. This will have the same effect. So, we've seen that flex basis determines the starting size of a child flex item before flex grow or flex shrink are applied. However, so far, we've only applied global flex basis values which are affecting all of our child flex items. Things get more interesting when we use different flex basis values on different flex items. Let's delete the global flex basis value and specify our global width of 200 pixels. So everything is now the way it was at the beginning of the video. Let's give the first flex item a flex basis of 300 pixels. So we're targeting this one here with one inside of it. To do that, I'm using its class of square along with the nth of type pseudo selector with a value of one to target the first element of this type with a class of square. So this element here. So inside of this selector, I'm going to give it a flex basis of 300 pixels. As we can see, item one is now 300 pixels wide initially, and items two and three are 200 pixels wide initially because of their global specified width. If we now apply a flex grow value of one to all of our flex items, they will each grow by the same amount to fill the positive free space inside the gray parent container. The result this time, however, is different. All of our items have increased by the same amount, but because item one started out wider than items two and three, it's now ended up wider than them both. A flex item's final size after flex grow or flex shrink is applied to it depends upon its initial size, which is determined by flex basis. If we wanted to ignore the initial size of our flex items when increasing or decreasing their size using flex grow or flex shrink, we can use a flex basis value of zero. What this does is tell the browser to divide the flex items into equal sizes based on the total width of the container, regardless of their initial size. For example, if our items have no absolute width specified, they would be sized based upon their content. Let's delete this flex basis value from item one, delete flex grow, and delete the absolute width from all of our items. Each element now has a different starting width. If we were to apply a flex grow value of one to all of our items, so flex grow one, they would grow to fill the container but would end up as three different sizes. They started as different sizes and end as different sizes. 
We'll take a quick look at this with the Chrome developer tools. So this first element has a width of 294, second 338, and third 363. They're all different widths. However, if we apply a global flex basis value of zero to all of our items, the browser will ignore their initial size when sharing out the total width of the container and each item will end up the exact same size, 332, 332, 332. So if you have a number of differently sized items but want them all to end up as the same width inside their container, set their flex basis to zero and use flex grow of one. Finally, all of the examples in this video have been in the default flex direction of row. If you are working with a flex direction of column, the principles are exactly the same, except it is the height of the items and their parent container that you need to be concerned with, not the width. Items will grow or shrink along the vertical axis instead of the horizontal axis, so it's their height that will be affected. That should just about cover the basics of the CSS Flexbox Flex Basis property. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer as soon as possible. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.